Okay, welcome back, composers and arrangers. Today we're talking about the very big category of percussion. And we'll get into the nitty gritty in class, but uh, this is just kind of a, an overview just to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, so a, a quick uh, history lesson. Of course, percussion instruments, we're talking about the oldest instruments to mankind. This is at the dawn of our civilizations from Asian and African cultures. Um, before the 20th century, in, in the 17th and 18th century, um, what we think of as our, our common percussion instruments, you know, those are things like the, the cymbal, the bass drum, the snare drum, well, that's stemming from the Turkish military, uh, uh, which would then um, make its way into uh, what we think of as Western classical music. So this is the, the derivation of that. And eventually um, that st started showing up into churches, opera houses, and concert halls. So it's interesting, it's coming from the outside, which makes a lot of sense. It's a very, these are very noisy instruments, they're very loud, and they're being brought inside. And this is when we start hearing um, percussion in the, the world of, uh, you know, the classical music world, the Mozart, Haydn, Beethoven, triangle, snare drum, cymbal, and bass drum. Um, around the same time, we also have the timpani, which were then called kettle drums. And you can see that here's a picture of them, uh, which were tightened by hand, not easily tuned. So often we're talking about tonic and dominant only. And uh, you know, how many times have you heard bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, bum bum, bum right? Our, our common five one ending. Well, there's a good reason why this is what we tend to hear is because these are very cumbersome instruments at least at first. Now, now we have pedals that can change the pitch quite easily, uh, but historically uh, that wasn't the case. Um, so auxiliary percussion was used as in a decorative way, in an incidental way, and as Rimsky-Korsakov says, with no intrinsic musical meaning, which is really interesting. I include this because I think this definition is really out of date. Remember, this is, this is uh, at the end of the 19th century Rimsky Korsakov um, had an older view of what we think of now, what is possible with the percussion. And now we know, of course, well, actually, you can make the percussion into the main ingredient. Uh, it can be your the protein in your meal, not just the sauce or the spice. So it depends on, of course, what what medium you're operating in and, and what are your overall goals. But I think it's it's true that traditionally, of course, uh, you know, if let's say you're you're you have the good fortune of orchestrating a piece uh, for orchestra or for band. Well, I think you can think more in those terms of, uh, well, the percussion is meant to double or punctuate more so than be the main focus. Well, that I, I think that is a good place to start. And of course, you can you can add to that. In the 20th century, Donald Grantham reminds us it's important that, that the importance of the percussion increased providing the characteristic sound or a characteristic sound. So, um, and I think this is true with a lot of pieces. Um, you know, when, when I'm looking to, to create a, a sound world, let's say I, I want to uh, create a scene that, that evokes the sea. Well, I might even use the ocean drum uh, to evoke the sound of the sea. This is a great way to, to make a characteristic sound or um, you know, all, all kinds of different, let's say you want the chimes, which will kind of represent clocks or perhaps metallic uh, instruments to represent the banging on pipes to represent uh, the, the, modern, uh, the modern man or the dawning of civilization, et cetera. So you can, you can see where I'm headed here, that percussion can really add that X element in your orchestral piece or band piece that will kind of draw a more vibrant picture. There are two broad categories uh, that you can think of in terms of how you use the percussion. One is thematic and structural aspects. Um, it's providing structural aspects of the music. Often that's timpani or solo percussion passages. Certainly you can you can have a timpani solo and that this can hold our attention for a good amount of time. But more often we're talking about the purpose of color, fortification, intensification, punctuation, doubling. This is what we've heard a lot of uh, so far in the course 
uh, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, uh, Copeland's Hoedown, for instance, which has all those great percussion instruments, and most of them are doubling most of the time, as opposed to, let's say, it's fan for, for the common man, which where that percussion is its own thing in dialogue with the brass. Um, okay, both categories are, are infinite and cannot be thoroughly categorized. This is so true. And of course, you can mix and match in one piece. This isn't to say you must do this or you must do that. Um, and of, this is one big thing that should be noted. I, th I feel like it's a very easy thing to say, and it's a hard lesson to learn. So if you go through this and you make the mistake of, um, of overriding your percussion, you will find that it can just take over the whole concert hall. It's so loud um, that it can really take over, but it also can be so soft at the other extreme. So consider the, the great dynamic range that you have at your disposal um, and use it, use it carefully. Okay, the basics, of course, we, we know um, sticks tend to be used for, let's say, the snare drum, uh, suspended cymbal, um, any, basically anything else that you can, you can hit that is harder than it, right? Mallets tend to be used for, let's say, here we have marimba mallets mostly, that we also have some harder mallets, which are for xylophone. Uh, then we have the brass mallets, which are for um, bells, otherwise known as glockenspiel. So the basic rule of thumb is you shouldn't be hitting anything that is, is made of a material that's lighter than the beater or the mallet, I should say. All right, so in general, bass drum will be, will be played with a big, soft mallet. However, it can, it can be played with a, a harder mallet as well. You don't want to play it with, let's say, a metal mallet. That would be no good. Um, can we play uh, metal on, on metal? It's not uh, typical, except, except for in the case of, I'm, I'm thinking of cymbals. I suppose that would be possible, but more than likely it would be with a stick. You can see there that sticks range in thickness. So of course, the thicker it is, the, the more easily loud it is. In, in the classical world, you're not going to find incredibly loud or incredibly heavy sticks. That's more in the marching band world. Um, you could consider if you, if you are writing for a children's ensemble and they're having trouble controlling their volume, you could, you could consider writing for rods. Those are the, the little bundles of wood, which get, have, they're nice to grab and they're, they're easy to play but they just produce less sound. So this is a, a, nice, a nice way to use sticks without producing too much sound. And lastly, brushes, which we tend to associate with jazz and the use of, especially with on a snare drum, but of course you can play just about anything uh, with a brush, especially let's say on a drum set. Okay. You can also contract the brush to be a little bit tighter, or you can extend the brush to be a little bit looser and it will produce a slightly different sound. So as you can see, there's there's so much variety in terms of mallets and sticks. Um, leave a lot of that to the percussionist. They know what they're doing. They're trained to pick the right mallets, but you can give them a hint. You can say, oh, I want uh, medium mallets here. Oh, I want hard mallets here. I want soft mallets here. If you give them a little bit of a direction, that's nice for them just to, to have a sense of what you're thinking. But then let them get into the, the really detailed work they, you don't need to know that they're using four different mallets on your on your marimba piece, they will choose those, but you could say well I want in general I want a, a harder mallet here and th that'll be a good place to start. Okay, so wow the, the wonderful world of percussion is so varied and in terms of what you write for and it's so varied how you write for it. If you see here, there, there's so many different ways to, to write. What you often find at the beginning of a piece is a kind of drum key, a, a, a place that shows, okay, these symbols mean this. In a, in a orchestral setting, sometimes you can do something as simple as writing a single line and just say what that instrument is. This is a very simple way to use it. If you have a lot of back and forth, let's say you have one player playing with snare drum sticks and they're going back and forth between woodblock and snare drum and crash cymbal, well then yes, it would make sense to, to write that all out on a single staff. So consider what is it you're, who is it you're writing for and how can you best represent that? What's the best and most simplest way 
the most simple way to represent that on the page. Um, you can get really bogged down with the symbols, but but do know where the basics are. Take a look where snare drum is. Take a look where bass drum is. Take a look where toms are. Take a look where 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 symbols are. In in general, these these are pretty much universal. Um, the other symbols, however, are are really debatable, and often you need to define them up front. This means this. Percussionists are used to seeing that and, and figuring out, okay, this composer wants X, Y, and Z kind of technique, and this is how they are writing it on the page. Okay, as I said, you can use a single line staff. You can use, you can use stems up, stems down. You can also put the note head on the single line. Here we have snare drum, bass drum, gong here. Okay, not a bad idea. Or here we have three different instruments, hi-hat, snare drum, bass drum. Um, and the, you have a single player playing all three of them. This is a good way to represent that as well. Notice in all of these cases, you have the percussion clef. This is important to note when you're writing your miniature coming up that that's using um, various rudiments that uh, you need to be using the percussion clef. You shouldn't be using treble or bass. All right, and this is indefinite pitch. That's all that means. Okay, in terms of sticking, and this is where we're getting into a bit of rudiments, right? It's, the, it's not tech, technically necessary um, to know stickings unless you have a really specific thing in mind. So especially if you have one player playing multiple instruments, well, this can be really useful to know uh, a paradiddle, for instance, or double strokes, or flams, or drags. These are, these are really useful um, elements of music that will help the player get around and uh, make um, very specific techniques happen. Uh, make sure you know the, the rhythms are playable, especially if they involve more than one drum. In general, most percussionists will play with quote unquote right hand lead that is starting with the right hand and continuing so that the strong beats happen on their strong hand. Is this always the case? And do you always need to know that? Well, I think especially if you're writing for younger players, you should start with that assumption that that is how they are being taught. And so you should write music with that in mind. Of course, the, the more complex you get, the, the older the player, if we're, if we're talking about college or professional, well, you can, let, you can let the professionals figure that out. You don't need to write in sticking unless you, you know that who, who your audience is and you have a really specific goal in mind. A knowledge of basic rudiments can help with sticking and with idiomatic phrases for percussion. I think this is really where we're headed is if you know these basics of the rudiments, get your list of, you know, uh, 25 common rudiments, practice a little bit, and then you'll have a good sense what is possible and how can I write music that, that is fitting for the instrument, that is playable and is pleasing to the instrumentalist. This is always a good place to start. In terms of different kinds of instruments, you have uh, percussion instruments uh, with definite pitch, uh, AKA mallet percussion, and the, the other is indefinite pitch, also called auxiliary percussion. It just depends on which, which textbook you're talking about, and any given day you might exchange those terms, but people know what you mean by pitched and non-pitched or indefinite. Um, this is an interesting uh, classification, another system by Eric von Hornbosten of the 20th, Bostel, excuse me, of the 20th century. This is from the Sam Adler study of orchestration. And I think this is interesting. It's worth noting that you could parse the various instruments another way, which is idiophones, membranophones, chordophones, and aerophones. Idiophones being the vibration of the entire body, meaning triangle, symbol, woodblock, mallets. Membranophones, like it, like it sounds, there's a membrane, the vibration of skin or membrane tightly stretched and fastened over a resonating shell, meaning timpani, tambourine, snare drum, bass drum, toms, bongos, chordophones, which is the vibration of their strings, for example, dulcimer and piano, and aerophones, vibration of a column of air within enclosed body, let's say the whistle or the conch shell, for instance. 
Okay, all of these th things a percussionist is expected to be able to make. It's such an am amazing body of instruments. And just, just to think that one percussionist can play all of these various objects is unto itself quite amazing. If you think it, it's, it's totally different than, let's say, a pianist who's expected to play the 88 keys of the piano or a violinist who, who is expected to know how to bow and know how to tune and know how to produce those, those pitches on the fingerboard consistently, or a brass player who is expected to make the, the correct embouchure and press the correct um, uh, valves in order to produce the, the right note, right? So quite, it's quite different than, than all of the other families that we've, we've spent time with. Um, choirs, I should say, this is the percussion choir. Okay, so there you have it. another way to think of percussion in these four categories. Timpani is a big subject. Um, it will depend on, on what you have available, but you tend to have four of them. Of course, you can have fewer or you can have more. Four is a good place to assume that you're starting. Uh, if you're writing in, in more of a conventional style, you could write as, as few as two. Um, so it, it depends on, of course, your forces you're writing for. In general, you can think of them within the range of a fifth, and you should choreograph them in a way that, okay, they're not constantly playing, they have a little bit of time to tune in between if they need to change notes. And again, do you need to choreograph every single, <coughs> excuse me, aspect of um, the four timpani, let's say? Well, no, but you make sure that they have enough time and that they're not expected to play, let's say, four different notes here, and then two bars later, they're expected to play another four different notes. Well, that would be too much tuning. Uh, but they could play, they could change one of those notes very easily in two bars. So consider that times have changed in the last hundred years and, and percussionists are able to do uh, very amazing things, including uh, fast pedal changes on the timpani. Okay, and as you can see that you, it, it, it's expected that you could uh, right. Okay. Here, here's what's coming up. D, B flat, C, E flat. These are here are the notes that I'm going to ask you to play in this next section. This is a nice note. I do this too when I I write for timpani, just to give the timpanist a little heads up to say, here's what's coming. Uh, make sure you have the tuning uh, ready. Uh, you might also think of okay rehearsals. Uh, let's say okay, folks. Let's start on page such and such or movement two. Well, you want to have your tuning ready. So this is nice to think of the, the timpanist and what they have to go through to make sure they're ready. Okay, and lastly, um, you might see roles written in different ways. Uh, of course, on a on a timpani, you're talking about a single stroke roll, back and forth, right, left, right, left, right. Um, there is a specific timpani technique. You'll notice the way they hold their mallets is completely different than, let's say, um, snare drum technique. <clears throat> that excuse me that tends to be um, it, it has its own history of timpani play uh, it's quite fascinating but you you'll notice oh yeah they do hold their their mallets differently and they they move uh, quite differently in fact it's almost as if they're drawing the the notes out of the timpani as they play um, and this is true for rolls as well you can see here that one roll is written with a with a trill, the other is with three slashes. Both of these are trill. Uh, both of these are rolls, excuse me. Um, but the more modern way would be to to write with slashes. This this trill notation is really an historical um, uh, historical convention, let's say. Okay, here's another typical uh, typical um, kind of roll passage. Think about what this means. Let's let's practice this. So this would be roll two, three, four, release to rest. So that rest means they're going to mute the drum. We don't want sound on beat three. Okay. The next passage: roll two, three, four, release and rest. So again, they're going to mute on beat three. Um, now that quickens, here's measure five. One, two, release, rest. One, two, release, rest. So every time I have that rest, that is where I'm muting the drum. And the second system, one, release, two, release, one, release, two, release. Now, 
what you don't need to know, is, but if, if you're curious, you're saying, well, isn't that that C going to ring while the G is starting? Well, actually, timpanists are so good that they, they often will mute as they're playing the next the next note. So this is something that timpanists do so that you don't get more than one drum ringing at the same time. So if you want a really clear sound, um, you might you might see them muting in between. So there's a lot going on there with with timpani. It's a very important structural part of of the symphony orchestra, and and of course concert band. Timpani are, are capable of every shade of tone from pianissimo to fortissimo. This is really true. You can ask a pianist to play a uh, pianist, a timpanist to to play very softly and extremely loudly. Uh, trills, tremolos, rolls. Uh, those are all the same thing. They crescendo, diminuendo, perform sforzando, piano, and attacks. This is this is great. It's it's great, especially in combination with the brass too. They're often asked to fortify the brass. And just as we've said, it's possible to to mute uh, or or let's say dampen. But another aspect is if you want a muted sound, you can you can say mute, and this will. They have several different ways. I've seen people put something as simple as a wallet, but there are actually mutes, uh, which are made out of a thin piece of felt, which you put on the drum head, and that will will keep it from ringing too much. So it, it does sound like a, a bit of a muffled sound. Okay, mallet percussion. Again, this is a big, this is a big topic. Um, we're not going to get into all the details in this course, but this is good to just know the difference but the basic differences here see what's what's similar what's different well of course they're all arranged like a keyboard of course the crotales is is different out of that bunch just because of the shape of uh they, they don't have bars um but they are arranged in a similar order uh like we we have for the glockenspiel notice which have have bars and which don't okay uh which have uh which have um, vibrating columns and which don't, which has a pedal, ah, the, the vibraphone only, uh, which is made out of wood. You might be thinking the xylophone. Actually, it's typically made of uh, fiberglass these days. So really, marimba is made out of wood. Um, xylophone is fiberglass. It's what, how we get such a piercing sound. So so high and so so clean and piercing. It can cut through the whole orchestra. Vibraphone, even though it's made out of metal bars, um, is quite soft. It's very easily covered, so you have to be careful how you use the vibraphone. And of course, glockenspiel, otherwise called bells, as uh, a metallic instrument, um, that it does fortify um, a high passage very well. You can you can call for a solo, but be careful about it holding its own. It's better as a doubling instrument, let's say with piccolo or high violins. Same with crotales. Crotales cut through really nicely, but it'd be better to fortify those notes if you really want to hear them well. Wow, percussion is, is so varied. Look at uh, these are the kind of basic instruments that you certainly you know of already. The snare drum, bass drum, triangle, tambourine, tom-toms, which can be can number from, let's say one tom, two toms, three, four, five. You can call for a group of tom-toms usually. Suspended crash cymbal don't always they don't always look like this. Sometimes they they look more typically like um, you would see in a you know rock band drum set. Uh, but this is the idea that you would be essentially taking a crash cymbal and suspending it. The bottom there you have the bell tree, temple blocks. These are all very common and wood blocks. Okay, so we don't have to get too much into beaters. But just know that it is possible to call for different kinds of beaters, different kinds of sticks. These are different symbols that are shown to to represent um, various aspects of percussion. Again, you don't have to use all of these. This is really dependent on on what your your aim is. And lastly, um, timpani timpani players are considered separate members from the percussion um, section. So make sure you know that that in general they're not going to play other instruments. They're not playing auxiliary percussion as well or mallet percussion. Just think of the that as the timpanist. That is their role. Other percussionists can play a variety of instruments. Um, just think: um, can a player switch from one instrument with sufficient time? 
And how many percussion instruments can one person play simultaneously? Think of it yourself, go through the choreography and, and try to work out, okay, can I play this? Can, do I have enough time to switch from here to here? Try to work that out in your mind, or you could even set up, uh, you know, a little setup for yourself at home, uh, draw a picture if you need to, or try to imagine going from one place to another. Do you have enough time to switch? There is quite a bit of choreography involved with percussionists. And lastly, percussion can dominate an ensemble. Use it sparingly, less is more. I can't tell you how many times I've learned this myself. I keep erasing notes because it's just so powerful sometimes. Consider if you're using it as a color or as a character, in parentheses, in a soloistic way. And in general, you're gonna use it to punctuate, fortify, intensify. This is, this is the most common way to use percussion in an ensemble. But of course, it can be used as the main ingredient, not just the spice as well. Okay, there you have it, our, our exploration of the, the percussion. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. And of course, we're just dipping our toe into the waters. So uh, we'll, we'll get more into the details shortly. I hope you have a good time writing a miniature based on those rudiments. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing you soon. Take care.